Hello, good evening. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us tonight for session two in our series, The Science and Practice of Pediatric Weight Management. Tonight's topic is diet interventions to prevent and manage adolescent obesity. My name is Charles Broadfoot and I'm one of the professional development officers with Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network. I would firstly like to acknowledge the First Peoples and traditional custodians of all the lands in which we are meeting on tonight. Pay my respects to elders past, present and those emerging and also welcome any and all of our Aboriginal friends and colleagues who may be joining us online. Tonight's session is being recorded as per session one and these recordings can be accessed in our PHN education library. So from tomorrow, you can head to our website, thephn.com.au and click on the education tab. So tonight we will, we will be using Slido for polls, questions, and also the session evaluation survey. So to access these, the polls and Q&A tabs are on the right-hand side of your screen. So if you're watching from a computer or laptop, um, alternatively, you can head to slido.com. So that's S-L-I-D-O and enter our event code, which is PWM2, which stands for Pediatric Weight Management, and then the number two, a third option is by scanning that QR code that's popped up on the bottom of your screen. So please keep an eye out on our polls tab as we do have a couple of poll questions during the presentation and we would love you to participate. So please type your questions in the Q&A tab at any time throughout our presentations tonight. But please note after the presentations, we have allocated some time for a Q&A panel discussion. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's facilitator, Dr. Natalie Lister. So Natalie is a senior lecturer in National Health and Medical Research Council, Early Career Fellow with the University of Sydney. Natalie is also an, accredi is also an accredited practicing dietitian. So thanks again for joining us tonight. I'll now hand over to you, Natalie, to introduce the session and tonight's speakers. Thanks, Charles. So tonight is, as Charles said, a second uh, event as part of this series on paediatric weight management. And so the previous session, we looked at um, really the assessment and identification of obesity, and we had um, some speakers talk about the medical management. So tonight's session is really going to focus on adolescent obesity, and we're going to be hearing from a group of uh, dietitians and researchers uh, who are um, we will have a series of talks. So we'll have three talks uh, looking at pediatric weight management. And then we will have a di clinical dietitian present us some case studies. So the first speaker tonight is Dr. Stephanie Partridge, who is a senior research fellow and my bio for Steph has just disappeared. Sorry. Um, Stephanie is a Senior Research Fellow at the University of Sydney, and I might hand over to Steph to introduce herself because I have just lost the internet connection. No worries. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so my name is Stephanie Partridge. I'm a Senior Research Fellow and NHMRC and National Heart Foundation Early Career Fellow at the University of Sydney. I'll get my slides. Thank you. Um, so tonight I'm going to take you through um, obesity prevention and um, some nu nutrition communication for young people. Just, uh, next slide. Sorry, I've lost the connection. Um, so this slide just shows you the um, adolescent overweight and obesity um, in New South Wales from 2005 to 2017. And if you look at the, um, the blue line in the middle, um, between 2014 to 2017, it shows that adolescent overweight and obesity appears to have plateaued. Um, we know that there's been heavy investment in childhood overweight and obesity. Um, but then if you look at the yellow line, which represents 16 to 17 years, we're seeing a 57 um, a 57% increase in the incidence of obesity among older adolescents. Um, and this is particularly concerning because we know that um, in 2000 and, 
17 to 2018, uh, 41% of young people aged 15 to 24 years had overweight and obesity. So we're, not, we're seeing an increase in overweight and obesity among older adolescents and particularly as they go into young adulthood. Um, and this is often because there is a lack of services and a lack of focus on these two population groups within our current health system. So the current health system has a strong focus on children and on adults. And young people are often these forgotten population group in the middle. And we know that obesity negatively impacts on quality of life and the effects are greater uh, during adolescence than at any other time during childhood. So we know that the environment both in utero and throughout life um, it will determine whether an individual's genetic predisposition to obesity is manifested or not. And this um, figure just shows you that there's a lot of different factors which um, affect that. So there's the individual as well as the family. Um, and areas that I'm particularly interested in that is the community influence. So that's our, the environments that young people are exposed to through schools as well as recreation facilities. And then again, at the societal and political level. And there, that's where we see influences from uh, the media as well as policies and strategies that are implemented. So I guess one of the things that I'm particularly interested in and what my research focuses on is our digital environment. So young people are going through um, uh, physical development changes, neurological development changes, psychological and social changes. And in today's world, this is combined with access to social media. So we know that most young people, over 90% own a mobile phone, and the majority of young people have access to um, social media accounts. Um, so on these sites, they're shown advertising from food companies as well as um, from influencers as well. And they also have access to um, a lot of different food products, for example. They can have um, purchased food and have it home delivered um, within 30 minutes. And then they're also shown that this is what they're supposed to look like. Um, so this is the body image ideal that they're presented on social media, but then they're being advertised by celebrities to be able to purchase unhealthy foods. And then we're seeing advertising, for example, uh, Cadbury was a massive sponsor of the Olympics as well as McDonald's. And this kind of advertising flooded our screens during the Olympics when we're seeing um, athletes perform at their best, but they're, and they're definitely not being fueled by Cadbury and McDonald's. And then they're being shown biased, um, I guess, pop culture documentaries um, with biased views on what they think, what health is supposed to be. So this is becoming our cultural e-wallpaper, and it's a very confusing um, and complex space for young people to have to navigate. So one of the pieces of research that I've done recently is looking at um, the strategies that have been implemented across New South Wales, specifically for adolescent obesity prevention and management. And we identified 41 strategies that are currently um, being implemented across New South Wales, um, both rural and regional areas. And then we compared those strategies to a best practice framework that we created um, using um, frameworks and guidelines that have been published. So for example, the New South Wales Health Youth Health Framework, the national framework, and as well as best practice guidelines for obesity and um, obesity prevention and management. And these are the domains that we identified. So adolescents should be supported to optimise their health. They should have accessible health services. Uh, they, they should have a health system that responds to their needs. They should have supportive environments. Um, and importantly, there should be monitoring and evaluation of all strategies implemented to understand if they're actually having the effect that they we intend that, that to be. And there should be a strong focus on health equity and targeting young people who are most at risk. So I'll just highlight some of the gaps that we identified in this review of those 41 strategies across New South Wales. So when we look at whether adolescents are supported to optimise their health, and this is within the context of overweight and obesity and risk factors for overweight and obesity, so nutrition and physical activity. So we identified that there's really no targeted uh, public education campaigns on physical activity or nutrition, specifically for young people. There's a strong focus on children as well as families and then people with uh, adults with chronic disease. But there's a real gap in this um, public education space for young people. They really have no online access to youth specific and trustworthy health information. Um, so there's, again, the New South Wales um, 
programs that have been implemented are mostly targeted at children as well as um, families and older adults. Um, and from some of the work that we've done, we've just completed a series of focus groups with young people. Uh, and what they're telling us is that they can't find this information online. Often their first port of call is going to a government website, but they can't find what they need. And then they're turning to social media and they're getting that information from influencers, which can be obviously dangerous and provide them with misinformation. There's also limited evidence that adolescents who are at risk are actually being directed to opportunities for health promotion and early intervention. And that's likely because of the services that we identified. So we identified nine um, secondary and tertiary prevention services that young people can access across the state of New South Wales. And we know that before they can even access those services, um, they mostly have to have a comorbidity. There are some services where they can access it for secondary prevention, but a lot of services require young people to already have established insulin resistance or hypertension, as well as having obesity to be able to access, access services. Now thinking about access to health services, what we found was there was, only, there was limited secondary and prevention, um, obesity prevention services for young people, um, particularly for older adolescents. Um, some of the services were actually capped at 15 years. Um, and as I sh showed you in that first graph, we're seeing that really upward trajectory in young people who are 16 to 17 years. So it's particularly concerning for this group because they are often that forgotten population group in the middle. And eight of the services that we identified were actually in uh, metropolitan Sydney, and only one, I think, was in the Hunter and New England um, network. But there was no other services available for young people um, in rural and remote areas. There was also limited access. So this is specifically in the context of overweight and obesity. Um, young people didn't really have access to sort of a telehealth or digital health program that they could access within this space. They can access the Get Healthy service, but that does start at 16 years. And we know that program is really targeted at people really uh, in their mid, uh, mid 40s, that program. And there's really no promotion to increase the uptake of programs, existing programs for young people. We know from the youth health framework that was published by the New South Wales government, where young people had a voice within creating that framework, they preferred when a service had information available about it online. And that really helped them, um, encourage them to attend that service. And we found that there was really limited information about overweight and obesity services online for young people. When we look at the health system, if it responds to the needs of young people, um, we found limited consumer participation and community engagement within the services um, that are currently existing in the strategies. There was limited holistic support to optimise quality of life in this space, so things like community gardens or school programs or parenting skills programs. And then looking at the last three domains, we found limited evidence of uh, physical education and nutrition education interventions in schools. Very few programs or in strategies had an evaluation that was publicly available. So there's really lim limited evidence of long-term follow-up. And that's really important to actually, to understand whether these programs are, are sustainable and whether they're having the intended effect. And there was a lack of focus on priority populations. So only a very few of the 41 strategies actually mentioned specifically targeting young people who are more at risk of overweight and obesity. So young people from rural and regional areas and young people from low socioeconomic backgrounds. So one of the ways that we're trying, um, my research is trying to address this gap, particularly in that digital health space um, and that secondary prevention space um, is our text fight study. So we know that over 90% of young people own a mobile phone. Um, they can send upward of 50 text messages per day. We know that text message programs for chronic disease are effective. So there's demonstrated efficacy of these programs in people with cardiovascular disease and type two diabetes. They offer flexible delivery, particularly for the health professional who's delivering the program. They're simple and scalable. Most mobile phones can receive them. Um, they don't cost anything to receive. And I think this is really important for young people. Because often when you develop a program that uses a smartphone application or an internet connection, um, you know, that's using valuable um, uh, data from young people. And that's most, mostly the most valuable part of their mobile phone plan. And you don't require an internet connection. Um, so regardless of where they're located, they'll still be able to participate in the program. 
So we've co-designed this program with 40 consumers. Um, so that was 25 uh, diverse young people, as well as 15 health professionals from backgrounds in eating disorders, physical activity, nutrition, uh, general practitioners, um, as well as dietitians. We also hired a young person researcher who worked with us for the entirety of the development process for this program. So we have a bank of now 107 messages which form our program and they're focused on it's focused on nutrition behaviors physical activity behaviors general behaviors as well as mental well-being and sleep so the program is specifically targeted at young people who are above a healthy weight um, who but who are not well above a healthy weight so it's in that secondary prevention space um, and the messages aren't focused on weight they're focused on positive behavior change So our final message bank has messages related, as I mentioned, nutrition, physical activity, um, general behaviours. And in this category, we try to relate to issues of concern to young people. So climate change, um, education, as well as mental wellbeing. And six of the messages prompt them to text back. And during that time, they can communicate with a health counsellor. So that's me on the other end. Um, so I can respond to any questions that they have around these behaviours or um, and specific to their life. And they can also set up an opportunity to talk to me and set up a health counselling call over the phone. Um, and a further 25% of our messages um, encourage two-way communication. So it might be a short quiz or just a question. And 22 of the messages differ by age. So we found that younger people tended to prefer a bit more uh, different messages and then we took to the older, older ones. We've tailored them in that regard. And here's just an example of a message, a message that the health counsellor um, would send. So how is everything going? Text back if you'd like to chat. And it's really good because it gives them the opportunity to, um, you know, think about what they have on that week and then they can send a time that suits them and I can give them a call. So we're currently testing this program in a randomised control trial. So we're seeking 150 young people. Um, we have 38 recruited to date. So um, I'm very keen if you're able to help refer to this program. Um, so young people are either randomised to the intervention group or the control group. Um, and then it's a six month program. And then we follow them up again at 12 months. And after 12 months, the young people in the control group are offered the full program. So our primary outcome is uh, BMI Z score, and we're also um, secondary outcomes include weight to height ratio, we've got diet, physical activity, as well as um, eating disorder and depression. Now, because of COVID, we made the program fully virtual. So um, young people don't have to go anywhere to be able to sign up. Everything can be done online and over the phone. So to refer to the program, we're looking for young people who are 13 to 18 years. Uh, who are above a healthy weight. So that's an age-specific BMI in the 85th to 95th percentile. Um, they have access to an active mobile phone. Uh, they live in Australia. Um, and we also screen for eating disorder and depression, which Caitlin will take you through the eating disorder screener that we use as well. And young people that meet a certain cut point for that are referred back to their GP to get clearance to participate in the program. And as I mentioned, it's all online. There's no in-person visits. Um, and young people, if they're interested, they can complete the um, EOI form, which is at that, um, I put the address on the slide, um, and they can also email to join as well. Thank you. So now I'll hand over to, um, back over to Natalie, who will um, do the next presentation. Thanks, Steph. Uh, that's a really great introduction, I think, to my slides. If I could have the slides, please. Fantastic. So I think what Steph has taken us through is a really great introduction to adolescent obesity. And what I'm going to be talking about is uh, the dietary treatment of obesity to, for adolescents. So what I'm going to focus on this evening is that more moderate to severe obesity end of the scale where adolescents are well above what would be considered a healthy adult weight. So even though they may have some more growing to do and they are often presenting with cardiometabolic complications or are highly likely to present with cardiometabolic complications in the near future. So let's just take a step back for a moment 
and consider the need for intervention. So last time Louise spoke about assessing and identifying obesity and raising the issue with the family. So let's assume that we've all done those things and we are now at the point where we have an adolescent presenting for treatment and think about whether we should consider doing nothing or taking a wait and see approach. So the evidence would suggest that adolescents seeking treatment are highly likely to have increases in their weight if they are waitlisted and that way is highly likely to persist into adulthood with many associated complications. And the most serious of those is probably type 2 diabetes. So we can see that adolescents are not just at risk of developing future problems, but are increasingly being diagnosed with conditions such as type 2 diabetes or fatty liver disease or high cholesterol. So it's really important when, uh, to assess and monitor for these comorbidities during interventions. Okay, so now I wanted to highlight what, what we consider when we're considered the treatment of obesity um, in adolescents and the outcomes of dietary interventions. So we, it's not always focused on weight loss. Outcome is, the outcomes that indicate an intervention is effective might include a reduction in weight-related outcomes such as BMI, or also we should consider a change in weight trajectory. So um, an adolescent may be presenting with an upward weight trajectory and weight stabilisation may be a treatment target. We can also consider improvement in obesity-associated complications or changes in um, markers of future complications or even just a change in health behaviour so including more vegetables or having regular family meals might be an important outcome. So I think there can be a misconception that weight management interventions in children and adolescents are really focused around weight um, but I think in reality a great clinician will consider these outcomes while monitoring progress but actually what they're communicating to the families and the adolescent is quite different and there's a focus on well-being and behaviours rather than a focus on the number on the scale. So I also think it's really important that we consider what adolescents themselves are looking for when presenting for treatment. So this table is taken from a systematic review looking at motivations for treatment-seeking adolescents with obesity. And highlighted in yellow is the motivations that are tied to physical health, things like being healthy, um, medical reasons, or avoiding future diseases. And highlighted in green are those things that are tied to mental health and well-being. But I do think we need to also be aware that there are some motivations that are tied to physical appearance. So things like attractiveness to the opposite sex or wearing stylish clothes. Now, these motivations from a clinician's perspective or a parent's perspective are probably not ideal, but also I think probably not unreasonable things for an adolescent to, to want. So I think just when we're considering uh conducting an intervention, we should be considering the context in which the adolescents are presenting for their obesity treatment. And we can also see this in the Australian context. So we know from the National Obesity Strategy that adolescents were involved in, um, that they are seeking a hol holistic approach to care. And something that consistently came up in focus groups was that they wanted better recognition between health and well-being and healthy lifestyles and how they related to weight. So I think what we can learn from this data is that adolescents are really taking, um, wanting a health-focused approach for our, from our interventions and considering both mental and metabolic health. Okay, so now I want to turn your attention to clinical practice guidelines and evidence base for dietary recommendations. So I guess firstly, the bad news is that we don't currently have clinical practice guidelines for overweight and obesity management in Australia with the 2013 um, clinical practice guidelines having been rescinded and hopefully we will have some new guidelines soon, but um, I don't know when that will be. So without current national guidelines, we can look more broadly at uh, international guidelines and recommendations to guide our practice. So our team has recently published a review of international pra clinical practice guidelines with the aim of summarising the international recommendations for dietary management. So we identified 28 guidelines and if we start by looking at treatment goals, what we see here is that already that there is quite a bit of variation internationally. However, the overarching treatment goal for management of paediatric obesity relates to whether uh, to either make weight maintenance or weight loss. So weight maintenance being the slowing of weight gain is generally the most recommended by guidelines for adolescents with obesity. 
However, as we get down to that more severe end of the obesity scale and for particular groups like post-pubescent adolescents or adolescents with complications and clinical signs of insulin resistance, that's where we see recommendations for weight loss. Now, if we look at interventions that are recommended by clinical practice guidelines, our review found that all guidelines recommended a multi-component lifestyle intervention, which includes diet, physical activity, and behavior modification. So there, was also recommend, there were also recommendations for a minimum number of 28, 26 contact hours over six to 12 months. And I, I think Steph has really highlighted that that is not happening in Australia, although it is considered to be the ideal. Um, Recommendations also, um, 27 of the 28 recommendations in recommended family involvement, uh, 22 address sedentary behaviours, and eight recommendations, um, and four recommendations from recommended sleep, addressing sleep behaviours. So um, all of these behaviours are actually covered in the eight healthy habits, and that was introduced to you last week, and I think Alicia is going to go a little bit through the eight healthy habits in a moment. So the types of dietary approaches that are recommended in clinical practice guidelines include things like calorie restriction, when we're looking at the more severe end of obesity, intensive or prescriptive interventions such as very low energy diets or very low carbohydrate diets. And so I'm going to come back to those in a little bit in a, in a moment. But now I just wanted to turn your attention to the evidence base that informs clinical practice guidelines. And the most recent Cochrane review was published in 2017 for adolescents. It included 44 randomized control trials with follow-up periods of six to 24 months. And when we compared waitlist control, waitlist inter to intervention, no, waitlist or no intervention treatment controls to interventions, we saw a mean reduction of around three and a half kilos. Um, and what's important about this is that the, for the follow-up periods of out to 24 months, these results were maintained. So I think this is in, um, in contrast to the adult literature where we see a weight regain at around 24 months. And we need to investigate this further because there is the potential that interventions for adolescents don't see the same weight regain that we see in some adult studies. So over the past few decades, there have been increased research into novel oral prescriptive dietary approaches for treatment of adolescent obesity. So this has been due to the recognised need for an evidence of a variety of approaches because we know that one size won't fit all. So these approaches generally aim for weight loss and so therefore are recommended for adolescents at that more severe end of the obesity scale. And I think they should be considered as alternatives to pharmacotherapy or surgery. Um, so I'm just going to take you through some of these approaches now. So um, we have actually published a paper recently outlining some of the dietary considerations, but I'm just going to talk through some varying macronutrient composition diets, some very low energy diets and intermittent energy restriction. So if we start by looking at um, research into diets of varying macronutrient composition, and they've been around for some time. Um, so this graph shows a conventional diet along the bottom and the macronutrient composition for a high protein and a low carbohydrate diet, where the pink represents uh, carbohydrate, blue represents protein, and the yellow represents fat. So higher protein diets are hypothesized to lead to greater weight loss because they increase satiety. But uh, we actually see in research that there's no difference in between the diet, between different diet groups when they're isocaloric. Low carbohydrate or very low carbohydrate diets tend to have moderate amounts of protein intake and a high intake of fat. And short term studies have actually shown um, some benefit for weight loss and improved insulin sensitivity. But in the longer term, there's no difference when compared to a low fat, higher carbohydrate diet. Now let's look at very low energy diets. So very low energy diets are strict diets aiming for less than 800 calories per day and typically less than 50 grams of carbohydrate a day. Uh, so they aim to induce ketosis and that suppresses appetite and are generally only used in the sh short term for rapid weight loss. And I know that um, the interest in these has increased in recent years because of the potential 
for reversing type 2 diabetes and they've also been used uh, prior to bariatric surgery which is increasing um, being used in adolescence, although not particularly accessible in Australia. So this is a quite an intensive diet and it requires both dietetic and medical supervision uh, by an experienced team. And I know that Alicia is going to talk a little bit more about VLEDs later on. So I'll let her follow up with that. So intermittent energy restriction is the third diet I wanted to take you through. So it's not currently covered within clinical practice guidelines, but it is used in some tertiary, set, set, tertiary settings under supervision. So it's popularized as a fasting or, or intermittent fasting or 5-2 diet, and you may have seen some of these diet books around. So we know that one variation has been tested in adolescence, and that was actually a pilot study done by our team at the Children's Hospital at Westmead um, and we saw a moderate weight change and found that adolescents reported that the diet was feasible and acceptable so we're now conducting a larger RCT. Um, there's also a different variation called time restricted feeding where um, you fast for a period of, period of 16 hours and then feeding over an eight hour window. So there was a case study um, published last year which was a retrospective chart audit of five children and adolescents um, which showed some promising results and I know that there is a larger trial plant in the US so we can um, potentially see some more evidence for this at, um, as time goes on in the next couple of years. So I just wanted to highlight that we are currently conducting our intermittent fast 5-2 uh, diet, intermittent energy restriction um, randomised control trial and we are just in the final processes of getting a Central Coast site uh, approved so if you're wanting more information about that you can um, head over to our website and um, and we can we'll soon be able to recruit and see participants at the Central Coast site. So finally I just wanted to consider um, in considering appropriate dietary interventions for adolescents, I think we need to consider that they need to fit into their current eating behaviours. So adolescents often present with poor eating habits and behaviours, such as irregular meal patterns, breakfast skipping, uh, and they may even be avoiding eating at school. And because of these irregular meal patterns, they may end up eating quite large portions of often nutrient poor foods that are generally high, um, have a high intake of snack foods or fast food and sugar sweetened beverages or soft drinks. We also should consider the nutritional adequacy when planning a dietary intervention. So adolescents being at a time of rapid growth and development, we need to ensure adequate nutrition, particularly uh, if we are reducing energy or the energy content or the amount of food, it really limits the opportunity to um, for micronutrient intake. So I can talk a little bit more about this if anyone has any questions, but just in the interest of time, I, um, I have just added a couple of references there. So in summary, adolescents affected by moderate to severe obesity uh, should be offered professionally supervised interventions aiming for weight loss or weight maintenance, um, which are, these are likely to achieve modest improvements in weight and cardiometabolic outcomes. And uh, prescriptive therapies should be considered as alternatives to pharmacotherapy and surgical intervention. So I'd just like to say thanks to my team and I will hand back over to I'll hand over to Caitlin, who is going to present on eating disorders. Thanks, Natalie. Um, hi everyone. Thank you for having me as part of the webinar tonight. My name is Caitlin McMaster and I am a dietitian and a research fellow at the University of Sydney um, and I'm currently working at the Illawarra Eating Disorder Service in Wollongong and have spent um, most of my clinical life since graduating um, working in the space of eating disorders. So tonight I'm just going to talk through a few considerations in terms of eating disorders in the treatment of obesity in adolescents. So eating disorders are complex mental illnesses and they can have wide ranging medical, nutritional and psychological consequences. Eating disorders often coexist with other psychiatric disorders, so things like anxiety disorders, substance misuse or mood disorders. We also know that individuals with eating disorders have elevated rates of suicidal behaviour compared to the general population, as well as impaired health related quality of life. 
um, compared to the general population, as well as individuals that have other mental illnesses. So when we talk about eating disorders, they can have a, a spectrum of presentations. So some patients might present with some risk factors. So things like body dissatisfaction, maybe some dieting behaviors. Then we have the next level up where someone might present with more of a subclinical eating disorder presentation. So things like infrequent binge eating episodes, irregular um, compensatory behaviours, but they're not quite meeting the diagnostic threshold for a clinical eating disorder. And then we have the pointy end of the scale where um, patients meet diagnostic criteria as according to the DSM-5 for eating disorders like anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa. And there is this, also, this other category called OSFED, which stands for other, feeding, other specified feeding and eating disorder. And I guess I just wanted to um, make note of one of the diagnoses under that category, which is atypical anorexia nervosa. Um, so that's where um, the criteria for anorexia nervosa is met, except that despite um, someone having significant weight loss, the individual's weight is still within or above a normal range. Sorry, I'm just getting, if I could just have the next slide. Sorry, I think my clicker is just timed out. Thank you. Um, so really when we look at prevalence, the main thing to point out is that over time we're having um, an increase of this eating disorder risk factors and subclinical eating disorders, particularly among individuals with overweight and obesity. Recently, we've had some research coming out um, on the impacts of COVID and it's shown that there has been a restriction in, uh, an increase in restriction, I should say, and binge eating in the general population during COVID compared to um, prior to COVID-19. So specifically looking at eating disorders in Australian adolescents, we have this really great study that was done by Deb Mitchison last year where they had data from just over 5,000 children and adolescents aged 11 to 19 years. And the point prevalence of eating disorders was about 22%. Generally, we had a higher prevalence of those OSFED or those other specified disorders um, compared to full criteria eating disorders. Eating disorders were experienced across age, weight, socioeconomic and migrant status. And eating disorders were more likely to be experienced in adolescents who had a BMI percentile within the overweight or obese range. So what are some of the things that we wanna look out for? We wanna look out for if patients are engaging in unsupervised dieting, if they've got body dissatisfaction, or if they have some other mental health concerns. So dieting in particular, we have a study that was published in the 90s um, that looked at data from about 2,000 adolescents aged 14 and 15, and they measured dieting using the adolescent dieting scales so, and looking at things like calorie counting, skipping meals. And they found that um, girls who had a severe level of this dieting were about 18 times more likely to develop a partial syndrome of an eating disorder. And those that had a moderate level of dieting were five times more likely. The other thing from this study showed that psychiatric comorbidity predicted the onset of eating, eating disorders independent of diet status. So subjects that had quite a high level of psychiatric comorbidity had almost a seven times increased risk of developing a partial syndrome of an eating disorder. We have two other nice cohort studies which have shown that body dissatisfaction is a strong predictor of eating disorders and that's also amplified by if someone has depression as well as whether they're dieting. And um, another study of about 1,200 young high-risk young women with body dissatisfaction showed that negative affect and functional impairment was predictive for all eating disorder diagnoses and also thin ideal internalization, body dissatisfaction, dieting and overeating predicted specifically thresh, sub-threshold and threshold bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. 
So I guess the thing to consider is, will treatment for obesity make these things worse? I'm very lucky to be able to have some um, data from some systematic reviews and meta-analyses that uh, researchers that I'm fortunate enough to work with at the University of Sydney have conducted. And I guess um, in a nutshell, they wanted to look at um, obesity interventions, specifically those that had a dietary component, what impact those had on things like eating disorder risk, as well as some of those risk factors like depression and body image concerns. So overall, the data showed that at post-intervention and also at follow-up, there was generally a reduction or no changes in both global eating disorder risk, as well as some of those individual symptoms and psychopathology that we might want to look out for um, when we're thinking about eating disorder risk. I guess the main one to point out, which uh, was a bit different, was dietary restraint and dieting. And so generally the results showed that it either was unchanged and there was a couple of studies where there was an increase in, in this variable. And really that comes down to, um, it seems to be in contrast in some of those other studies that I spoke about where um, dieting was a risk factor. And it seems to be more related to about the, the type of dieting or the type of dietary intervention. So rather than the dieting being something that the adolescent is doing unsupervised, unstructured, maybe influenced by some of those things that Steph talked about in terms of social media or influences in obesity treatment it's something that's supervised and managed by a multidisciplinary team. When we look at some of the other eating disorder risk factors, things like depression, anxiety, body image, these things all appeared to improve at both post-intervention and at follow-up. So overall, the current evidence suggests that professionally supervised obesity um, treatment programs are safer for adolescents. This is probably because of the structured and the moderate nature of the dietary intervention, as well as things that Natalie just spoke about in terms of um, you know, looking at a whole range of variables, not just weight change in, in addressing obesity. And also the multidisciplinary and um, uh, varied nature of the support for behaviour change, so having a dietitian, having a GP, having a psychologist. Another factor seems to be having that more frequent and extended contact as well. However, the studies did still tell us that there are a small number of individuals who might present to treatment with an undiagnosed eating disorder um, or depression, or they might develop these during or following treatment. So we still want to have a few things that we think about um, in terms of eating disorder risk when we're considering obesity treatment for adolescents. In particular, we want to be mindful of screening and monitoring. So ideally, as much as possible, we want to screen for both eating disorders and depression prior to engaging in weight management treatment. And the reason we also suggest the, the screening for depression is that the studies that we have at the moment are, um, that validate eating disorder screening questionnaires in adolescents specifically with overweight or obesity are pretty limited. So we don't have a measure that we can just pull off the shelf that we know is going to absolutely capture everybody. So as a result, I've just popped up some suggestions in terms of um, that's really been informed by the fast track to health protocol that Natalie mentioned, and it's also um, been uh, used as part of Steph's text bites study as well, which combines using the eating disorder examination questionnaire as well as a measure of um, depression. And then based on previous evidence um, and experts' uh, opinion, they've established a threshold by which people who um, meet that threshold are then referred for assessment by a psychologist and or paediatrician to make sure that we're capturing anyone that might be at risk or who has an eating disorder. It's also really important for us to um, monitor behaviours throughout treatment. So things like excess weight loss, binge eating, whether that's with or without loss of control and other compensatory behaviours and obsessive thoughts and behaviours. So 
say you have someone that does present to um, your service that you might be concerned needs a bit more support with their eating or do have you do have a concern about them having an eating disorder diagnosis your first option is really just your straightforward mental health care plan and that at the moment under COVID is providing up to 20 sessions of subsidized um, Medicare treatment with a mental health professional. The other thing that is now available to our patients since November 2019 is an eating disorder care plan. So these are eating disorder specific Medicare item numbers and this means that eligible patients can access up to 40 sessions of Medicare subsidized treatment with uh, a psychologist per year as well as 20 sessions of Medicare subsidized dietetic treatment um, over a 12 month period. The plan can be developed by a GP, a psychiatrist or a paediatrician. They do require that GPs review the patients after every 10 sessions of psych treatment. And there needs to be a midpoint review done specifically with a psychiatrist or a paediatrician um, at that 20 session point. In terms of locating services specifically, um, a good place to start is the Inside Out Institute Treatment Services database. Um, there are secondary level services specifically for eating disorders, both on the Central Coast and Newcastle. And the database will also give you um, some suggestions for private practitioners that have expertise in eating disorders. So psychologists, dietitians, GPs, uh, social workers. Um, I'm, you may also um, not be aware that every LHD in New South Wales has uh, pretty much a full-time eating disorder coordinator. So their job is to develop and support treatment pathways in every LHD to make sure patients with eating disorders can access appropriate and timely care. And finally, just um, a little bit of um, information in terms of a credentialing program that's been developed by the eating disorder field in Australia that's soon to be launched and basically will um, help support um, patients and uh, clinicians identify adequately trained uh, clinicians who can provide eating disorder treatment um, as to help them better navigate um, accessing treatment if they do have concerns from an eating disorder point of view. So a couple of takeaway messages. As much as possible, we want to try and screen for eating disorders and depression prior to weight management treatment for adolescents. Ideally, our clinical care should focus on providing high quality, professionally supervised weight management programs and facilitating access to evidence-based treatment, which is really essential to prevent some unsupervised dieting and weight loss behaviours, which may increase the eating disorder risk. We also really want to closely monitor throughout and following weight management treatment. And finally, um, if you are interested in doing a little bit more training, there's also some great um, resources available on the Inside Out Institute database, um, Institute website, I should say. They have a number of e-learning programs, which are um, really thorough. The National Eating Disorder Collaboration has also recently launched an e-learning program specifically for GPs. I think it's an online four hours self-paced um, training program and that's free. Um, you have to sign up to be a member of the NADC but that's free and then you are able to access the training program. And um, so now I'm just going to hand over to Alicia who will talk through specifically some case studies. Thanks Caitlin. Um, Hi everyone, my name's Alicia Grunsight. I'm one of the senior weight management dietitians at the Children's Hospital Westmead. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about what you could do um, when you have a, a child or adolescent that presents to you who's above or well above or healthy weight. Um, so I'll just, sorry, I'm just getting the the next slide up. Um, so before we specifically look at advice that you could give in a primary healthcare setting, I wanted to have a look at what we currently know is happening in terms of um, 
healthy lifestyle factors in children and adolescents. And one great source of information for this is the is the SPAMS data. So this is the School Physical Activity and Nutrition Survey. So it was it was present it was um, conducted in 2015 and the report was published in 2017. And it was a survey of about seven uh, seven thousand five hundred school age children. So both primary and adolescent age. So the data for this is actually broken up into primary school age children as well as high school age children. And then it's further broken up into Be My category and it makes for some really interesting reading. Um, so from this data, um, it told us that those children who are above or well above a healthy weight are those that are, are less likely to eat breakfast in the morning and also less likely to meet the 60 minutes of physical activity goal and therefore it makes sense less likely to be in the healthy fitness zone as well. We also know that those that are well above a healthy weight are more likely to drink soft drink each day and also more likely to get takeaway um, or fast food meals as well. So it tells a slightly different story when we look at adolescents. Um, first of all, you can notice that breakfast eating is fairly poor for adolescents across all weight categories. And so I want you to have a look at the second um, row there as well, which is vegetable intake, which is also very low at only about 7 to 11% of adolescents meeting the five recommendation recommended serves of veggies a day. And I'll just go back because you can see that's also incredibly low for primary school age children. So we know all children and adolescents, um, most of them are not getting their vegetable intake. Um, we also know that those that are above and well above a healthy weight also are um, not as likely to engage in other um, health activities such as brushing their teeth twice a day as well. Now, the data is also broken up into rural and urban areas, um, socioeconomic status, and as well as cultural background as well. Um, and we and this tells us that um, those from a low and middle um, SES backgrounds are least likely to eat breakfast, more likely to drink soft drink, um, and less likely to brush their teeth twice a day as well. Whereas those from an Asian cultural background are more likely to eat takeaway meals, less likely to engage in physical activity, where those from a Middle Eastern background are more likely to be driven to school. So that means they're missing out on that really important incidental activity. So we see a lot of these factors when, when children present to our clinic who are above or well above a healthy weight. And we also see other factors that are commonly associated with children and families above a healthy weight. Now, one of these is genetics. We know that um, people, you know, the parents give them genes, which means that they're more likely to um, put on weight. But then they're also then put into a very obesogenic environment and that means that the weight tends to go on quite rapidly. We also know that mother's weight um, during conception in, and in between pregnancies plays a role um, in whether a child will develop overweight and obesity as well as things like poor sleep habit, high screen time, lack of physical activity as well as um, but uh, lack of meal planning and preparation. So, for example, um, coming home from school, not having a set afternoon tea, but instead going to the pantry and grazing as well. We also know things like having little or no vegetables is associated with increased re weight. Also not eating breakfast or eating a poor nutritional breakfast. So having a slice of toast with honey or, or um, cocoa pops or something. 
as well as poor role modeling for the fam from from parents as well and so we know we know that healthy parents are more likely to have children that are in a healthy weight range um, and so one of the strategies we very much work on is family-wide changes and so when you're presented with a child who's above a healthy weight we don't want you just to focus on what that child is doing we want you to encourage family-wide changes So where could you start with this? Well, one of the best places to start, sorry, can I have the next slide? I've lost the connection on mine. Thanks. Um, so when you have a child, what's the first place to start? So what can be addressed in a, in a short appointment that you might have with a family? Now, the best place to start is the eight healthy habits. And I know Natalie referred to this earlier. And I also know um, Dr. Bauer went through this last week as well. But it really is the core messaging for families who have a child who's above or well above a healthy place. Uh, healthy weight. So this is the perfect place to start. So this covers eight habits where you can work with the families to encourage change. So the first one focuses on what they're drinking. So encouraging them to drink water instead of juice or soft drink. The second, the second healthy habit focuses on vegetable and fruit intake. So increasing that vegetable so they're getting closer to the five serves of veggies a day. The third healthy habit focuses on breakfast. So getting them to, the kids to have breakfast before they go to school each day. The fourth one focuses on portion sizes. Now, we often, when we have kids come to us in clinic and we ask what their serving sizes are like, we often see that young children, so six, seven and eight-year-olds, have portions that are the same size as teenagers or parents in the house. Now, obviously, we want to make sure the portion is appropriate for the age of the child. So a younger child should have a smaller portion than an older child, than an adolescent and, and then a parent. So as, the, as their bodies grow, their portions should also grow as well. The fifth healthy habit there is choosing healthy snacks. And um, what we really want to focus on is snacks that contain protein because we know protein plays such an important role in weight management and it is really important for satiety. The sixth healthy habit there is limiting screen time. So the recommendation is less than two hours a day. Now, I know where most of us are in lockdown still, and that's really hard to achieve at the moment. However, if you aim for two hours of leisure screen time, so once they've finished all their online schooling, um, and then two hours on the weekend, um, you might find that most families are doing more like five, six, seven hours, so you can slowly reduce it till you get to two hours. The seventh healthy habit there um, kind of relates to screen time because it's getting out and about for 60 minutes of physical activity a day. And what we want that physical activity to be is at a level that we refer to as huff and puff. This basically means if they're chatting to their sibling or their parents, they can still chat to them, but they're a little bit out of breath. And that's the kind of level of physical activity we're aiming for for an hour each day. The eighth healthy habit is sleep. So we really want a good sleep routine, even in lockdown. So we still want kids going to bed the same time they would be if they're going to school. We're aiming for that 10 to 12 hours um, for younger kids and that 8 to 10 hours for our adolescents. And um, linked in with um, sleep is making sure things like there's no screens that they're looking at right before bedtime as well. You'll see in the middle there, there's a great picture that says be healthy together. And that's what we want. We want healthy changes for the whole family. Now you can download the eight healthy habits from the Pro Healthy Kids website and also comes in a variety of languages as well. You can order some that also have the age appropriate BMI charts on the back as well. 
So I'm just going to go into these in a little bit more detail. Um, so the first one, and it's the really simple step to make, but it's really, really effective advice, is to have water as the main drink. So ask them what they're drinking at school. So not taking any juice poppers at school or cordial, just having their water bottle. Also making sure that no soft drink is kept in the house. So if someone in the household wants a soft drink, they can have it when they go out for dinner or when they go to the shops, but not bringing it into the house. As soon as it's in the house, it's going to be consumed. And then, of course, if kids do want a treat, we recommend flavoured milk instead of a soft drink. And that's because of the high protein um, content of milk. So as I mentioned before, protein plays a really important role in weight management. So what we're trying to aim for is protein at each meal and snack. Um, so protein is really important for that satiety effect. So if a child comes home from school and they go to the cupboard, grab a pack of chips or a piece of fruit that doesn't have any protein in it, they're soon going to go looking for more food um, 10 or 15 minutes later. And that's when that grazing starts to happen. So instead, we want an afternoon tea that is going to fill them up that contains protein. So something like crackers and cheese or fruit or yogurt. So just asking, what do you have for afternoon tea is a really great way to address this. Vegetables is also really important for weight management. And what we're aiming for is half a plate of vegetables. Vegetables are so important because they contain little or no calories. They've got lots of vitamins and minerals in them. But most importantly, for weight management, they take ages to chew and they've got lots of fiber that helps them fill them up at the meal. So if you have a half a plate of vegetables, you're not going to immediately turn around and ask for seconds of your meal. So this is ideally what we want a plate to look like for, for children above a healthy weight. So we want that half a plate of veggies, um, about, a, about a hand-sized portion of protein. So for, for children, that's their hand, not an adult's hand. And um, for lunch, include some of the fingers. For, um, for lunch, include just the palm. And for dinner, include some of the finger, fingers as well. And then in terms of carbohydrate, what we're looking for is less than a quarter of the plate taken up by carbohydrates. So that's bread, rice, pasta, potato, sweet potato, and corn. And that's because we know a lot of kids that are well above a healthy weight have insulin resistance. And that means their body can't handle a large amount of carbohydrate. So you can also easily address takeaway food as well. So just saying to the family, let's have just a, once a week, give them some quick and mealy, easy meal options as well. So something that they can have on the table in under 10 minutes. It could be something as simple as a toasted cheese sandwich with some carrots and cucumbers on top. And then making, when they do have takeaway, make healthier choices. So instead of a large Big Mac meal, go for a small one. Instead of a Coke, go for Coke No Sugar and try some grilled options or wraps instead of burgers. And of course, refer. So if you have a child above a healthy weight and you've given them the eight for a healthy weight, then refer to local services. So on the Pro Healthy Kids website, there's a list of um, local weight management services. For you guys, the closest one is John Hunter Children's Hospital. Or as Natalie said, um, you could always refer to Fast Track Trial if they're an adolescent um, and to attend the Central Coast um, branch of that. Um, you can also refer to your local dietitian um, and they can get a, a care plan from the G, GP that covers the cost of five dietitian visits. You can always refer to Go For Fun as well. It's a fantastic free program for kids aged 17 to, 7 to 13 who are above a healthy weight. And there's also Get Healthy, which um, Natalie mentioned before, which is a free health coaching program for children over the age of 16. Now, I've just got a case study. Um, so we've got Peter here. So Peter is six years old. And um, 
as you can see, sorry, I'll just get back to the chart. As you can see, he comes to your service and he's been above a healthy weight for a while. He's a very tall child, but when we plot his BMI in the appropriate age for pre BMI chart, you can see his BMI is well above a healthy weight. So Peter weighs 47, nearly 48 kilos. He has a very sedentary lifestyle. So he comes home from school, sits down, has afternoon tea and plays computer games. Mum knows he's supposed to eat more veggies and will sometimes force feed him, which results in him vomiting or just replaces them with mashed potato or rice because then at least he's getting something. He has lots of juice and soft drink instead of water and bedtime's quite late around 9 to p.m. Um, after watching TV. In his lunchbox, he has four packaged snacks and money to go to the canteen. Now, what I'd like you to do is go onto the Slido poll and uh, what I want you to do is fill out the poll um, where you would start. So if Peter came to you, where, what advice would you give to would you do eight healthy habits? Would you refer to the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating? Would you refer to go for fun or the Get Healthy Helpline? So I'm just waiting for the poll to come out. Okay. It's saying on my screen 100% would say eight healthy habits. Um, I'm not sure whether whether um, that's complete, uh, that's taking everyone into account, but that's where I'd start. I'd start with the eight healthier habits. The Australian Guide to Healthy Eating is a great guide, but it's actually made for well people, not people above a healthy weight. In terms of go for fun, he's just a little bit young for it now, but as soon as he turns seven, you can refer him to go for fun and you can always refer the family to the Get Healthy Helpline as well. So yes, I would refer to the eight healthy habits. So focusing on water, physical activity, working on the lunchbox, only one package snack in there and make sure something has protein in it for that satiety. Offer him vegetables, but don't, don't put any pressure on to eat. Um, but don't replace the veggies with more carbohydrate. Instead, have some more protein on there as well. And think about a bedtime routine. We'll then weigh the whole family using appropriate charts. So I'm just very quickly going to go through very low energy diets and when they should be used in our lessons. So we use a very low energy diet, so something like using Optifast as meal replacements if we have an adolescent present to us with severe obesity. So that means a BMI over 35. Um, it's only appropriate for an adolescent over 12 years. It is very effective, but so it aids... Um, in quick weight loss. So it's really effective if someone has those comorbidities we often see. It's not a long-term diet, so it's only short-term. And then what you need to do is transition slowly off. So it's more like the healthy lifestyle habits that we see in the eight, um, eight healthy habits. One advantage, but is it increases vegetable intake. And we see that tends to then last once they finish their VLED. So as Natalie said, we do it with three meal replacements a day plus one low carbohydrate meal. Uh, ketosis means, so the body goes into ketosis on the VLED, and that means that they, even though we're restricting calories, they don't actually feel very um, hungry at all. Now, this is what it looks like. So we they'd have a meal replacement for breakfast. At school, they'd take some veggie sticks and um, something like a salad for lunch. For afternoon tea, they might have another real replacement and then we'd have that healthy dinner. So something with protein and those low carb veggies and then followed by another real meal replacement. Now, what we want is very much that dinner to look the same as everyone else's in the family. The reason we include that dinner is so they still get that social aspect of eating with their family. 
So obviously veggies are really important in a VLED. And if you told them just have salad and grilled chicken all the time, they'd get bored really, really quickly. So what's important is you look at different ways to use vegetables. So doing things like a vegetable rattata or a vegetable ragu, or if you make a bolognese or taco mince, put it on zucchini noodles or in a half a capsicum roasted instead. And you can do great things with cauliflower rice. You can make it into a fried rice. You can do a cauliflower rice pizza base using cheese and egg and I actually made one into a taco last night as well which was really successful and there's also different um different options in the supermarket things like slim pasta and slendier pasta as well So we know VLEDs work really well um, in those adolescents with severe obesity. And in our clinic, they're one of four diets we offer. Um, and we've got three of the diets here, our health, general healthy eating or high protein diet, our intermittent energy restricted diet, so the 5-2 and the VLED. And as you can see, the VLED is the one that produces the best weight loss. So recommendations for clinical um, practice, it should only be considered in the treatment of severe obesity. Um, so those with a B, adolescents with a BMI over 35, it should be implemented by a trained health professional and they should have access to a dietitian followed up every two weeks to ensure that nutritional adequacy. Um, and once they finish the diet, you do need to slowly transition them off to prevent weight regain. So I've just got a quick case study here. And once again, we'll use the, the Slido um, poll. So we've got a 15-year-old girl, Jennifer, who's Aboriginal background. She lives with a foster carer who also has five younger children. She's got a weight of 151 kilos. So she's a, she's a big girl. She also has insulin resistance, obstructive sleep apnea, polycystic ovary syndrome, and ADHD. She's really hard to engage. So she only rated herself six out of ten for weight loss she couldn't give a clear reason why she wanted to lose weight however she turned up to the appointment and she started going to the gym twice a week with her auntie so she's made small changes to the diet trying not to pick out however she does skip breakfast most days she eats lots of chips and chocolates on the weekends and just grazes on the pantry so the question is, oh, sorry, this is her BMI chart. You can see her BMI is 47. It's in the severe obesity range and it's actually off the chart. So you'll sometimes see just little red arrows and that means it's too high to put on the chart. So what I want you to consider is what dietary option do you think would suit Jennifer? The eight healthy habits, something more intense like a VLED or a 5-2 diet, or just focusing on exercise only since, um, since she started going to the gym with her auntie. So I'm just waiting for them to come in. So we've got some people saying a VLED, some people saying eight healthy habits. Okay, we haven't had any responses on the 5-2 diet or the focus on um, exercise only um, either yet. So for this one, I'd actually offer her different dietary options and see what appeals to her. So she has a little bit of the decision making. Um, this is actually based on a real person. She chose a VLED and um, so we popped her on the VLED. Um, so in doing so, you have to think about vegetables and also how you're going to transition off her. When you transition off, you want to very much go to that high protein um, diet like the eight um, healthy habits and increase her exercise. But it's also important to consider how her family can support her and also getting those weekly weights to um, motivate her as well. Now, this family, they actually, um, the extended family as well as aunt, eights aren't eight aunts and uncles who did the VLED with her and they all were really successful because they supported each other. So if you are in the VLED, you have to consider, do you need to refer to anyone, whether that's a dietitian or making sure they have some medical support there from a GP? 
So in summary, when you've got a child who presents with you who's above a healthy weight, the best place to start is small changes based on the eight healthy habits, but make sure they're family-wide changes. So focusing on fam- water as the main drink, protein at each meal and snack for that satiety, increasing the veggies and encouraging healthy takeaways. Now, if you do have an adolescent present with you who has severe obesity, who has some of those comorbidities already, then consider a more direct approach, something like a VLED with some dietetic support and also um, refer to local services as well. So thank you to my team at um, Children's Hospital Westmead and I'm just going to pass back to Natalie for questions. Thanks so much, Alicia. That was a fantastic presentation. And I really enjoy when you present those case studies. I think it really puts things into perspective on what things are like in a clinical environment. So now I'm going to ask that we go to the questions on the Slido poll. Um, So I can see I've got a question come through for Alicia, I think, around giving advice for VLEDs that don't include meal replacements. Do you have any um, So it can be done. It um, So it can be done. And it's actually something we do with um, children with severe obesity who are above, uh, who are below the age of 12, because if they're below 12, um, some of the products are too high in vitamin A. However, it should really only be done in severe obesity. It, it is harder. It basically is lots of veggies, some protein, and what you're doing is reducing those carbohydrate. So you can use products like low-carb bread for breakfast. You can get one from Aldi. Um, you can use the Slim Pasta and the Slendian Pasta. And it usually works out about 1,000 calories a day, but you're still getting the same satiety effect. Um, I must say, but it's a lot easier when you do the meal replacements. And Even when we do it through food, most of the, even the younger kids would prefer just one meal replacement for breakfast because otherwise it's things like um, an omelette or scrambled egg or something like that. Okay. That actually leads into one of the questions that I was going to ask around um, examples of healthy breakfasts. And one of the eight healthy habits is around having a healthy breakfast and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what you recommend in your clinic for a a healthy breakfast. Absolutely. Thanks, Natalie. Um, So when we're talking about a healthy breakfast, uh, the thing I want you to remember is protein because protein is going to have that satiety effect for the kids and adolescents. So protein is found in our dairy foods, so milk, cheese and yogurt. It's also found in eggs and nuts as well as lean meat. So a healthy breakfast might be a whole grain cereal. So something like porridge or wheat bix or special K with um, some milk on it and the milk is the source of protein it could also be a yogurt so the yogurt is a source of protein with a piece of fruit um, or it could be a piece of toast with peanut butter or a piece of toast with an egg um, if you have a really reluctant veg uh, a really reluctant breakfast eater which we definitely come across all the time some kids just don't feel like breakfast before school but getting them just to have um, a glass of milk or if they like to have just a piece of toast with Vegemite getting them to have a glass of milk with that as well so you've got that protein for the satiety um if worse comes worse and they need to grab something on the way out something like an up and go is better than nothing okay sure there's a question here from judy who wants to know what uh thought our thoughts on families locking the pantry and fridge so i might Go to Alicia first of all and <laughs> Absolutely. comment on that. Uh, look, it's 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 not often necessary um, unless you've got a specialised condition where they've got hyperphagia. So that means basically they're always hungry and always searching for food. So you find that in some specialised conditions like Prada Willy or sometimes in craniopharyngiomas, which is a tumour on the um, hypothalamus. Um, 
Other than that, we don't see it very often. What I would say, but is you don't have to lock the pantry or the fridge, but you want to have only healthy food available. So either get rid of all the discretionary food from the house or um, put it up high where they can't see it so it's not in their eyesight. Because as soon as they open that pantry, if there's a packet of chips in front of them, that's what they're going to go for. If they're, Or if they open the fridge and there's soft drink in front of them, that's what they're going to go for. And okay. I might just add to that, Natalie, if that's okay. Um, I was just going to yes, say, go you know, from, from a disordered eating, behavioural eating disorder perspective, um, you know, often we can, for those eating disorder diagnoses or presentations that do have binge eating as part of the presentation, um, you know, if you've got kids who potentially have some of those risk factors or might have some of those um, predisposing factors to developing binge eating behaviours or even an eating disorder. Um, you know, those sort of like deprivation type, you know, very, very extreme kind of depriving them access to pantry or fridge thing is only going to likely intensify that, that binge eating because you are being very black and white about their access to food and potentially setting up, you know, quite severe dietary restriction, which then might um, exacerbate any binge eating, which could then affect, you know, them seeking out maybe engaging in compensatory behaviours like bird purging or excessively exercising or things like that. So I think from, you know, risky if you've if there's a family where there is potentially some of those eating disorder risk factors that it might create an environment where, um it's not helpful from that perspective. Yeah. I think um, too, I'll it might also, also... Um, build on Sorry, I was just gonna add one more thing. Um as well as you have if you have really um structured meal and snack times, um it often even with kids who have those specialized conditions or are more likely to kind of have the binge eating if they've got had a good afternoon snack um, and they know that a dinner's coming soon especially with kids who have that rapid weight gain with obesity it is often enough to then not need to to do anything more extreme Whereas if you come home from school and there's no food available, that's when they'll start to raid the cupboard or if you give them food that hasn't got that protein in it. Sure. I think that I just wanted to add, I guess, that um, that kind of locking of cupboards and pantries and things might actually also feed in, into weight stigma. And I know that Louise spoke a lot about that in the last session, but I think it really... Um, that there is some literature around that shows that particularly stigma from parental and sources is, is quite harmful and it feeds into that um, eating disorder mm -hmm. behaviours and things like that. So um, yeah. we do have another question that's just come through around our thoughts on cheat days. Um, does anyone want to tackle that question? Uh, do you want me to go? I can go, girls, yeah, with you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no one else wants <laughs> Um, so what I'd say is um, treats are absolutely fine. So in in terms of what we suggest to families, we don't say never have any discretionary foods or never have a takeaway, um, but just limit limit the amount of times you have it. So don't have a, a, a treat every day, um, just have, um, or a takeaway every day, just have it a couple of times a week. Um, in terms of cheat days, it um, very often leads to weight gain because what you'd find is on that cheat day, instead of just having one discretionary food, so instead of just having a takeaway or um, a bar of chocolate or an ice cream, you'd find on that day, the the whole day is taken up by discretionary foods. And so that often counteracts all the good work you've done before um, in the rest of the week. Um, so what I'd say, instead of treating it like a cheat day, just make sure you have some of those discretionary foods in really portioned amounts throughout the week. Absolutely. And I think... Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> 
Oh, sorry, Steph. I was, and you're probably going to say a similar something similar to me about um, uh, in terms of those cheat days. I think really there's a lot of exposure to those sorts of things on social media and online as well. And I think unfortunately um, that can be quite confusing because people say, oh, it's a cheat day, but probably I, I think some of Natalie's research that you've done around the social media stuff has shown that they're probably things that would be considered an objective binge episode perhaps that, um, you know, is then kind of labelled as cheat day um, rather than it being in a much more moderate, um, measured, structured way in the way that Alicia just spoke about it. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Alicia, and I think that's right. There, there was a study that was published looking at the, the representation of cheat days on social media and, and they are considered, some of those meals are considered to be an objective binge um, if they were eaten. So I think that that feeds into some of the work that Steph's done and looking at those confusing messaging around, you know, it's, a, it's these really thin white women <laughs> with very sculptured mm -hmm. bodies um, or particularly I think in the cheat meal ones there was a lot of um, bodybuilding men as well um, mm -hmm. that were very sculpted bodies uh, and and that really feeds into that sort of confusing messaging that uh, that the kids are struggling to sort of decipher and everyone sort of thinks that adolescents have this um, ability to decipher information online because they've grown up in the tech age but the reality is is that they're probably no better at deciphering information from technology than any of us and and there is some some data around that so i think it's it's challenging do you have anything else to add steph um yeah we we recently did some focus groups with young people and i one of the quotes that they said was what it was why would i ask my health practitioner or GP about this when Google has known me for 17 years uh, and I thought that was really interesting because it just gives you an insight into their world about how they can just go on there and think they can find the answer when it's a world of misinformation um, on there but I think as well um, adding on to what Caitlin and Alicia have already mentioned I talked to adolescents um, I guess maybe a little bit older and when they're really starting to form those independent behaviors and they're not within that um, are well above a healthy weight, they're above a healthy weight. So they're going to parties and they're, they're trying to navigate all these kind of situations where there is an abundance of food. And you know, we, you don't want them to be able to be restricted in those kind of situations and feel that sense of guilt. So a lot of the conversations that I have with them are about, you know, it's okay when you go to a party to, to enjoy these foods in moderation and you can have water instead of a soft drink and, and those kind of strategies as well. And often when they're with their families as well, they've got families that, you know, have unhealthy eating behaviors and they're the change agents then in their family. And they go away and have conversations with their family about how this is really important to them. And then, um, for example, I had a young person who um, her dad always bought these really delicious sweets and desserts and things like that. And we came up with a strategy where she could create a sort of a delicious dessert that was more healthier than what her dad was buying. And it worked out really well and her dad was really on board with it. Um, so, yeah, so coming in from their perspective and giving them that independence within their food behaviours and dietary behaviours. Okay, great. I think that um, we're almost out of time. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of the presenters who presented out their research and... and and the clinical trials and the clinical researches and the clinical studies as well thanks alicia so um i just wanted to say thank you to everybody and um i think we will leave it there and wrap up and i'll hand back over to charles thank you so much natalie i'd also like to uh on behalf of the phn um, extend my thank you to stephanie natalie caitlin and alicia for generously giving your time tonight, also preparing your wonderful content um, and sharing all of your insights and knowledge with our primary care workforce. So thanks again for taking time out of your busy days to share it with us. Um, and thank you to everyone who has uh, been online tonight and for entering in those questions. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this session is being recorded. So the same as session one. So the recording and the slides from tonight will become available from tomorrow in our education library on our website. 
And just lastly, you'll notice now in the poll tabs that the evaluation survey for the webinar tonight is live. If you could just take a minute to quickly fill that out before you log off, we'd really appreciate any feedback you can give us. We're always looking at ways how we can improve our education delivery for you. So that's all from me. Thanks again for joining us tonight and uh, we hope you have a safe and enjoyable evening. Good night.